description of right concentration. It talks about having directed thought and evaluation. And a lot of people approach that as something they have to add to what they're already doing. But that's not the case. Your mind is engaged in directed thought and evaluation all the time. It's how we talk to ourselves. You think of a topic, and then you question it. You make comments on it. The difference with the concentration is that you choose one object and you stay there. You think of the breath, and you comment to yourself on the breath. How is the breath going right now? Is it good? Is it not? Is it comfortable? If it's not comfortable, what can you do to change it so that it is comfortable? Make it longer or shorter? Or should you make it heavier or lighter? The way you experiment. All this comes under the, the heading of evaluation. And you keep at it until you get a sense of well-being from the breath. But sometimes you find the mind is not willing to settle down. It's got other issues. That's where you have to pay attention to the other parts of the description, which are that you put aside unskillful qualities and you put aside sensuality. In other words, any thoughts about how you would like things to be a particular way, in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, you've got to learn how to drop that. And then the other unskillful qualities, which are defined as anything from wrong view all through wrong mindfulness. You're keeping the wrong things in mind. You have wrong intentions. You have wrong resolves, wrong views about things. These can get in the way of your concentration, too. In cases like that, you've got to do some extra work. Clear away the forest of the mind. So you have a clearing here, at least some space where you can settle down. So in some cases, it's simply a matter of turning your thoughts to the breath, and they stay there. Other times, they're not going to stay there. They want to go back. And either it's because there's something not right with the breath, or something not right with the mind. So that's something you have to evaluate as well. You're sorting things out in here. And when you can sort out the issues of the mind, whether they're involved with greed, aversion, or delusion, things past, things present, things future, step back from, from, from them for a bit and try to identify what's the problem here. What does my mind latch on to? Is it Habitually angry, or greedy, or lustful, or fearful. Get a sense of what precisely the problem is, and then do some intervention. As the Buddha said, part of right effort is when you see that something unskillful has arisen, you try to abandon it. You don't just sit there and watch it. You watch it to some extent to figure out what it is, but once you understand what it is and you have some idea of how to deal with it, you go ahead and do that. And then you do your best to keep it from arising again. That's when you give the mind something else to think about, something more skillful. And this is how you can lean the mind into concentration. Once it's there and you're with a breath. And the breath starts getting comfortable, then the next step of evaluation is, what do you do with that sense of comfort? It's all too easy just to focus on the comfort and wallow in it. And you can stay there for a little while, but things begin to get very blurry. This is how you get into delusion concentration, where things get very fuzzy. When the delusion concentration is strong enough, you come out of it and wonder, well, where was I? Was I awake? Was I asleep? What was I focused on? You can't really say for sure. It's just a very vague sense of being very still. That's not helpful, because you want your powers of observation to be alert and active, even as the mind gets still. You want to know exactly where you are and what you're doing. And 
So how do you deal with the present pleasure so that it doesn't take over and, and blur out that alertness? We well, stay with the breath, and then you think, how can this pleasure spread? Give, you, give yourself a task to do here in the body. If you start feeling a sense of pleasure in the middle of the chest, okay, allow it to expand. So it fills the whole chest, and then from the whole chest down through the whole torso, up into the head, down through the arms, down through the legs. Over it starts at, in the head, okay, then think of it going down through the neck, both the front of the neck and the back of the neck. So it suffuses the entire body. When you can do that, there's a sense of well-being that drenches the body. Then you don't have to do all that evaluating anymore. You can just be with the sensation of stillness, be with the sensation of pleasure, be with the breath. Again, don't leave the breath for the pleasure, because the fact that you're paying attention to the breath is what allows the pleasure to, to stay. It's just that your relationship changes. This is what happens all the way through concentration. You stay with the breath, but your relationship just gets more and more refined as you figure out that certain activities or certain feeling states are good for a while, but then they start getting gross. Not gross in the sense of disgusting, but gross in the sense that they're very blatant and burdensome for the mind. And you want something more subtle, something more refined. And so you drop the more blatant things and see if you can maintain the sense of being centered here. If you drop them and you find that you lose your center, that's a sign that you're not ready yet. So you pick them up again. But what we're trying to do here is peel away different activities in the mind so you can get a sense of just being aware, clearly aware. I'm very alert right here in the present moment with as little disturbance as you can muster. Now, some people, when they get to that sense of just being aware, <coughs> awake, aware, and alert in the present moment, want to stop right there. It feels pretty good. If thought comes up, they say, oh, there's a defilement coming up, so let's just not think at all. But actually, once you get to that sense of awareness, you finally get yourself in a position where you can really do a lot of serious work. So you can see when something comes up, why, why did it come up? What came up with it? And if it's a thought that I have to hold myself back from thinking, what part of me wants to think it and why? It's in asking these questions that you learn a lot about the mind, and you clear up a lot of things that would stay hidden before. Because you're trying to peel away the, the noise that you make that gets in the way of hearing the more subtle noises of defilements as they're beginning to form in the mind. It's as if you've been humming a tune to yourself all along, and you can't hear the subtle noises in the room, the scratchings of the, the mice in the wall. So you've got to stop humming. That's when you can hear things. Or if there's a sound that's even more distant, even more subtle, you've got to get very, very quiet. It's like those satellites they send up to detect infrared radiation from the different stars. They have to have a huge shield around the radiation detector so that the heat of the satellite itself doesn't interfere with the s signals they're trying to get. In other words, our problem is that we're sending out signals all the time. We're sending out heat all the time. And we don't see you know, where are the subtle sources of heat coming from other places. So we've got to cool things down, quiet things down, and then look very carefully to see what's arising with what. That's what the word samudhiya means, things that arise together. There's craving and there's going to be stress. The craving is going to be subtle, and the stress is going to be subtle when your mind is really still. But you want to catch these things while they're subtle. You don't want to wait until they've taken over. And sometimes when things get still, you don't see anything happening at all. Well, that's when you can 
probe things a little bit. A thought comes into the mind, and it seems to go away right away. Well, tell yourself, let's think the opposite thought. If there's a slight thought of desire, say, for thinking about tomorrow's meal, okay, counteract that. Think about the, the foulness of food. It's edible only for a very short time. And then once it's past your throat, you wouldn't want to eat it again. And you think about where it comes. Everything comes out of the dirt. I understand there's a new law trying to keep dirt out of fruits and vegetables, as if they didn't come from the dirt to begin with. And here we are, eating earth. earth. And part of the mind's going to object. You want to Notice that it's a part that objects. That's what you've got to ferret out. It's the same with the contemplation of the foulness of the body. The part of the mind that objects, that's the part you want to look into. Why does it object to this kind of contemplation? What pride, what lust, what other defilements are in there in that objection? In other words, you poke things a little bit. Poke the mind to see how it responds. If you don't do this, if you just sit here with everything being very, very quiet, you might say, well, that's, that's pretty easy here being quiet. You've heard about the, the horrible things of efforting or putting too much effort into the practice. And you may have seen some of your own misguided efforts in the past, and you decide, well, just sitting here without any effort, that's nice. Then any of this questioning and probing sounds like a unnecessary activity, but it's not. Think of what the Buddha said about trying to get milk out of a cow. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. The right way is to pull on the udder. The wrong way is to twist the horn. Now suppose you've been twisting the horn for a long time and somebody says, hey, you twisting the horn doesn't get any results. So you stop twisting the horn and say, well, this is pretty good. I don't have to do anything at all. And Sure enough, not twisting the horn is better than twisting the horn, but you still don't get any milk. You may be relaxed and at ease, but part of your mind is still hungry. You're not getting the nourishment you need, because we're looking for an ultimate nourishment here. In fact, we're looking for a state of mind that is so well nourished it doesn't need to be nourished anymore. And that can come only by looking very, very carefully at the kind of nourishment you are taking. Little bites you take on the side, little nibbles you take on the side. So we get the mind still so we can see subtle things going on in the mind. We don't get it still just for the sake of stillness. We don't just be with the knowing just to be with the knowing. We're with the knowing so we can see well, what's going to come up in the knowing. When there's a minimum of disturbance or a minimum of background noise. Because it's the subtle things that drive the mind. And if you don't dig them out, they're going to stay there and they're going to keep driving the mind. And we're not here just to accept the fact that they're driving the mind. We want to put an end to it. Because these subtle things can grow into big things. As your strength of mind and strength of body begin to wane, you find that these little subtle things get more and more power if you haven't dug them out. So dig them out while you've got the chance, while you have the strength. So they won't be able to continue to bamboozle you. As the body gets weaker, aging, illness, and death are going to come. And the choices you make while you're old and sick and dying can have a huge impact. And so you want to make sure that you've cleared the decks as much as you can, so that the lack of strength in your body doesn't infect the mind. We're doing this for our own protection. And of course, in protecting ourselves from our unskillful qualities, we're protecting other people too. 
So it's good to be heedful about these points because they really do make a difference.